Anything with an engine has always fascinated me. From the time I was old enough to hold a screwdriver, I was taking things apart. At 15, I got my first car, and my love for automobiles hasn't stopped since. I guess you could say I've had an affair with every car I've owned, and there have been many. I always have something on the go in the shop, and I want to share what I've learned with you. We're hitting the road to talk to people who collect, restore, preserve anything on wheels. So let's go! Stop recording. Hey, welcome to Classic Drive Television. Today we got some great tips and some things we're going to do in the shop that you're going to be excited about. But first, we're going to take a look at the 1958 Austin Healey Sprite. Now this car, when it came out, was a revolution. It was the first affordable sports car that the everyday man could buy and enjoy and still use it to go to work. So one of the most unique things about this car is, of course, its headlamps. These were originally designed to pop up, but when they got into production, it just cost too much, so they welded them in place. Combine this with this cute little grill right here, and you'd swear the car was looking right at you and smiling. So let's take a look at the engine. It's actually a pretty well laid out engine bay here in our Sprite. Uh, as long as you didn't have a bad back, it was pretty easy to access, just lift up from the front. Now, our little 948cc engine put out a whopping 55 horsepower using these two one and a quarter inch SU carburetors. A cute little setup. But it is a rack and pinion system as well, so it meant it was a little sporty. Uh, took those corners, uh, really hugged the road, and that's why this car gained a reputation for rallying. So the Sprite is a small car, so it can be a challenge to get in. But once you're in, it's quite comfortable. The two-seater has enough room for, for everything, and if you hadn't noticed, it doesn't have a trunk, so you've got to actually access the back by folding the seat forward. Once you got the luggage in, you're ready to go. So let's take this car for a drive. So we're uh, out on a beautiful sunny day, taking the 1958 Sprite out for a drive today. This is a little two-door, uh, affectionately known as the Bug Eye, with its little pop-up headlights and uh, little smiley face grill. So uh, we talked about this car before. Um, 
You know, they brought it out in 1958, and it was 650 pounds. And at that time, you guess you'd call it about you know 650 dollars, really. Uh, so, as compared to some of the other little two-seater sports cars that the, the UK had brought out, as compared to say the TR3 in 1955, that was a thousand pounds, so almost twice as much. At any rate, uh, this was really the uh, car that. Uh, Got the guy off the motorcycle and into a little two-seater and uh, out with his girlfriend or in that matter, and she's whole families. They even had a baby seat center for it. Um, so it's a four-speed. So a little four-speed third and fourth are synchro and you know it, it, it bounces along okay it's lever shocks front and rear with quarter elliptical rear springs so in New England roads you really got to be careful but uh, she did turn into a real racer uh, a lot of people modified these they called them spridgets as they uh, uh, used to hot rod these and modify them so a whole industry popped up this particular model was built from 58 to 1961. <clears throat> you know, uh, driving the car, you know, for the most part, it's modern with the uh, with uh, third and fourth being synchro. But truth is, uh, you know, it's it's not high in horsepower, 43 horsepower. So she buzzes along and. Uh, as, as long as you keep the RPMs up, it's actually pretty fun to drive. Uh, very low to the ground. So, we'll, you know, she can, she can zoom around corners. Give her that. you're driving her you know you're feeling the road this is what true little sports car driving driving and riding was all about um, it got you where you were going it was fun in doing it and you could park it just about anywhere and truthfully you can you really can just about park this anywhere um, you know the truth was that uh, the guy who had the motorcycle could step up uh, and became a family car really When you think of things British, naturally in the United States, especially in the East Coast, you gotta think of the British invasion. Over a pint of ale in 1990, this event was conceived and over 600 cars come to this event annually. It's unbelievable to see the variety and the differences of the cars that are here. We're gonna talk to these owners and find out why this is the British lifestyle event. here with Bill and Steve Rule, and they've brought more of the eclectic cards to the British Invasion. They've actually brought a Beadmore taxi from 1958, and they've done some special things to it. Steve, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. And Bill, welcome to the program. Thank you. So tell us, uh, Steve, I guess you were the impetus to this, uh, this uh, car, this purchase, uh, something special. Uh, how'd you find it and why? Well, I found it online, and uh, a fellow had it in New York, Pennsylvania. And we had always talked about wanting to uh, rehab a London taxi, and so it just fell into our plan. 
So Bill, uh, you actually ended up doing uh, a lot of the work. So he did yeah. the finding and you did the work. Tell us about yeah. this. Uh, you know, is this a mission from God or, or it, what? It, it was a mission. Um, we had to completely disassemble it. Um, had to replace a lot of the wood. It had been out in the parking lot for years and it just sat there and basically rotted away. Uh, definitely a labor of love. Very but good. It was fun. It was fun. So, uh, Steve, uh, did, did you get your hands dirty on this, or did you stand by? No, I, he know, I don't know how to do anything like this. I maybe polished a little chrome, but that's about it. Did you supply the money at least? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could say that. All right. So I can come over and you can, <laughs> yeah. you can. Yeah, I, I see. So, so Bill, um, uh, tell us. You did. The, you even did the paintwork on this. I understand. I did, yes, I did the paintwork in the garage. Um, hours and hours of painting, and then even more hours and hours of wet sanding and buffing. Yeah, very good. Uh, it, was it a, was it a challenge getting this running, or was it running when you got it? Oh, definitely not running when we got it. Um, my older son Jordan rebuilt the motor. Um, yeah, we did clutch. First of all, we had to haul it off. The, we had to haul it off the trailer. The brakes were locked up, so we had to just pull it off. Yeah, we had to pull it off with a chain. Very good, very good. It was not in very good shape. <laughs> <laughs> so how many how many years did it take you to get her done? Uh, off and on for two years. Off and on for two years. Yeah. And this isn't the only classic in your stable, is no. it? No. No. What what else do you got? Oh, geez, we've got a couple of Heelys, two Minis, um, a Jag, a few MGs. Yeah, yeah, TD, yeah. TC. So really a, a family affair here, isn't right. it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you've got a you've got an interesting passenger here. Tell us about the passenger. Well, I came from a, a marketing background, and I always thought that if you're going to show something like this, make it something that people would like to see and might laugh about it. So I went on eBay and I bought a mannequin, and I got a rock and roll wig for him and Bill used to be in a band he had the leather pants and all those things so we dressed the, the dummy up and like he's a rock star and put his guitar case in there with a cigarette and a bottle of Jack Daniels. Well there you have it you know you can enjoy this hobby many ways and this is one of the more eclectic cars that came to came to the British invasion but anything is welcome as long as it's British. We enjoyed showing this car we'll be back. Hi, I'm Dirk Burrows, and I'm on the set of Classic Drive Television. And to that end, we'd like to have you here, too. Classic Drive is having a contest, and we're going to invite three enthusiasts with their cars to spend the day with us, learn all about them, and who knows, maybe even become a car star themselves. So, get your pictures together, tell us about your car, and send it to us to the address below. And make sure you check out our website and Facebook page for other details about this contest and upcoming episodes at Classic Drive Television. Hope to see you here. Hi, we're here with uh, Jeff Rogers at uh, Rogers Motors, and uh, he's one of the vendors that uh, provides the parts to your classics. And if you own a classic uh, British car, uh, you're probably already know if you don't, you will get to know uh, Jeff because he probably has the spares that you're going to need. Jeff, welcome to the program. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. So we've got a lot of stuff here. Uh, let's walk along and tell us a, tell us a little bit about stuff. You've got mirrors. Uh, it seems like just about everything, huh? Lots of little shiny things. We're, we're uh, big on uh, some of our favorite things are new old stock parts, an old part that was made probably 30, 40 years ago, still in its original box and hasn't been sullied by being put on a car yet. Oh. Um, so we, we source these wherever we can. We find them in England. We go to the Bewley Auto Jumble every year, mm. buy stuff there. So it's a, sort of a vacation while you're looking for parts, things like that, Absolutely. huh? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we've got some taillight sets, things like that. So a lot of the common stuff that people would be looking for for their car, if they're re doing restorations, they're doing things like that, huh? Yeah, or somebody somebody breaks a light. We actually sell hammers too, and I, I'm tempted sometimes to go out in the field and you know bang a few lights and leave a business card on the windshield. We haven't resorted to that yet. Ah, I see, I see. <laughs> Well, with a day like this, I imagine that uh, a lot of traffic, people just coming to get under the tent, it's got to be 80 already this yeah, morning, huh? Yeah, or if it's raining, we get a lot of traffic in here, too. Very yeah. good, very yes. good. You also sell some remanufactured and some non-original, but uh, look-alike original. We though. do, yeah. We sell a lot of, lot of uh, well, here's a good example. This is a Lucas 576 fog lamp. And, very uh, common, but... Uh, very common. Um, there are better reproductions and poorer reproductions. This is one of the better ones. Made of brass, it says made in England on it. You can believe that or not, as you as you like. And they sell for two fifty a pair. That's or cool. if you want a pair of original ones, um, 
these were actually restored originals. Um, so the backs were replated. Yeah. Uh, the lens is a new old stock part. Uh, the chrome little bits and bobs are newly made. The guy we make get these from actually makes these stems and uh, and nuts. And uh, these sell for a little bit more money. These are three fifty a pair. Well, you know, it, 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 it becomes sort of a sourcing business as much as it becomes, uh, uh, you know, selling of, of parts, isn't it? You have it to does, actually yeah. source and sometimes get involved in the manufacturing process. Yeah, we uh, are a, a partner with uh, uh, British Spares, Forrest Voges of Springfield, and he makes all the sheet metal, inner sheet metal parts for Jaguar XK120, 140, and 150. So if you need a floor or a sill or a pillar or anything like that, um, we, we uh, market all those things for forest. So that's all stuff that's, that's pretty hard to find. Sure is. So, you know, that's really, this is really about is it's made up of a network of really enthusiasts that realized that, you know, there wasn't any place to get some of these spares yet. These okay. cars needed to live on. So it was, the mission was called and they took up took it up and decided to get involved, isn't it? Just, yeah, it just, is. Right. Really. So, so tell us, how did you decide to get involved in this? Oh, well, when I was in high school, um, I sort of got bitten by the English car bug and started buying junky old cars and bringing them home to my parents' house. And one day I realized that I had a lot more parts than I would ever need to fix anything I owned. And my mother was kind of keen on my sort of moving things along. So, uh, so I just started advertising in Hemmings Motor News and in the MGA Club newsletter. And uh, it sort of it was a trickly business and it got to be more and more. And then three years ago we went full time, my wife and me. Very good. Well, you know, that's the story of so many, uh, so many small uh, companies that started. You know, it started out as a hobby, and the next thing you know, it became their business and uh, became a lifestyle, really. For Absolutely. Some. Yeah. yeah. We don't really ever get away from it. Sometimes I dream about Lucas boxes. <laughs> Little Lucas boxes under the tree? <laughs> yeah. I think Freud might have something to say about that. Ah, there you go. Well, again, we're with Jeff Rogers at, at Rogers Motors. You can find him at Jolly Rogers motors.com. He's also sells on eBay and a couple other places. And of course, we're here at the British Invasion and he's been a loyal uh, vendor for many years now. We've had a great time. Look Jeff up, get the parts you need. This is Classic Drive Television. Thanks for joining us. My name is Bruce Cunningham. This is uh, our car, this is a 1952 Jaguar XK120. Uh, I think it was uh, late high school, my brother and I got interested in antique cars, had a 29 Chevy, uh, which, we, uh, which was kind of a basket case when we got it, but got it into running condition and drove it a lot. Uh, so that was the beginning. Uh, that I got interested in sports cars uh, when I was in the uh, last couple of years in high school because we lived not very far. We were in Poughkeepsie, which is not very far from Lime Rock. So my brother and I and a good friend of ours went to the absolutely first opening race at Lime Rock in 1957. Uh, and that's when I fell in love with an XK120 when I saw it coming around the track. absolutely gorgeous and it was the fastest car in the field uh, and it really impressed me and I just fell in love with it. Well I was a mechanic in high school. Uh, my brother and I, our first car was a 52 Mercury. Uh, first thing we did when we got the car was took the head off the engine and put a new head gasket in. We had never worked on a car before. We're just natural mechanics. My father was a mechanic. I have a mechanics and engineering brain. Uh, it's just a natural thing for me uh, to want to work on machinery. After I work on it, I get to see the results of that work in addition to what was there before. So it just keeps adding and adding to, to the passionate attachment of it to me. Uh, 
I, 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 know it's, I know it's kind of hyperbole, but it feels like a spiritual connection to me. So let's take a look at the earliest car in the collection, the 1910 Rover. So for perspective, when this car was built, there was only 100 miles of paved road worldwide. So this really was the beginning of automotive uh, history, right then and there. Rover and a few other car makers really were the founders of the automobile industry in the United Kingdom. So this car, when you look at it, you're gonna see a lot of things you recognize on 2018 vehicles. Rubber tires, which were a, a big deal, it had only been invented just a few years earlier by Dunlop. And you're gonna see things like lighting, windows, and all of these things were novelties when it was built. And this car was way ahead of its time. It had steering wheel and steering controls. Many cars had tillers still at that time. You've got the uh, handbrake and of course the horn, a spare tire. You always had to have one of these with you because tires and deflating was, was a real problem back then. This tire is actually a solid rubber tire because tires were not necessarily as reliable as they were just new to the market. This is a single cylinder, 1,358cc engine, uh, and it was called the eight horsepower. It was a three-speed that could reach a top speed of 28 miles an hour and uh, could comfortably hold three people in a bench seat. This was a runabout, so the uh, back would have held uh, a suitcase and uh, you would have gone down to the store and you probably would have been well-to-do to own a car at that point as the mode of transportation was principally bicycle and motorcycle. So we're gonna have some more fun with this car. We're gonna see it run and we're gonna take it for a drive. So the 1910 had a lot of uh, modern accoutrements. The headlamp is actually a carbide lamp that involves dropping in a tablet of carbide and water and it would burn bright. Uh, they didn't have modern headlights or high beams or low beams or things like that. So just having a light was a big deal and it was an option. If you look at the horn here, it was really designed like a musical instrument. It has graceful lines and it's rolled up and it actually has a nice sound. <laughs> the car actually had an optional speedometer and that was a big deal. Speedometers were a very new thing. So a small company called Stewart Speedometer in Chicago exported their speedometer to the United Kingdom and Rover fitted it as an option. So in 1910, they were literally inventing what was gonna go in this car. That was the beginning. There wasn't reference materials and ways of doing things, so they had to figure it out then. This car was quite advanced for its time. It has a water-cooled single-cylinder engine, water pump, radiator, 
and really akin to modern cars. Simply pull out the decompression valve and crank it over. There were barely batteries back then, so most of the time it was crank start. There were no electric starts and uh, conveniences like that at that time. But it wasn't too long before those things came along. We're gonna take this car for a ride shortly, and we'll be back. Well, a different kind of motoring for you guys. Uh, this is a single cylinder 1310 cc uh, Rover 8. Stood for 8 horsepower. Um, uh, Essentially, uh, this is a revised version of the first car uh, Rover built in 1904. So this would have been refined motoring in 1910. If you think about how much work went into feeding the horse, putting him away, shoeing him, this was considered a luxury. All right, here we are, the one longer chugging along. We've got uh, an inline shifter, first, second, third, with the verse all the way back. Of course, there's no such thing as synchro mess. These are all straight cut, big gears. We've got the throttle on the left and the advance on the right, right at the steering wheel. We've got a brake, the pedal, clutch in the middle, and on the far left, we've got a, uh, a decompression valve. Yes, indeed, refined motoring. Truly the brass era. <clears throat> Wood, metal, cast iron, at its best. It doesn't get much better than this if you enjoy brass era driving. Uh, the English really had it down pat at the time. So, so if you enjoy driving in an old car as much as I do, you can't help but love a single cylinder early brass era car. There's nothing like it. Vibration, screws need to be tightened, but you know what? They always start and run. There's no ECUs, electronic ignitions, or special computers to hook up. It's gas, a magneto, and a hand crank, and away you go. So this is truly the horseless carriage. I'm going out for a drive. See you guys later. <laughs>